So how are you this morning? I am so honored to be here, to be one of you. Uh, this is a room full of my heroes. I think some of the most important people in the kingdom of God are gathered together here. I wish we had the time to hear every one of your stories. I would happily sit down if we could just suddenly absorb the stories of the heroes uh, in this room. But I know that there is music looming in the background, and so we will have to, uh, we will have to keep jumping along. Uh, I feel like I should be taking my shoes off because the topic uh, that we have gathered around is, is really sacred. This session, we focus on children, which is the ultimate center of all orphan care. It doesn't seem like we should have to make a case that children matter, but we actually do throughout history, all the way back from the time the disciples were shooing the children away from Jesus, all the way for the last 2,000 years, the church has behaved with its priorities, with its budgets, and with its strategies, as if Jesus in Matthew 25, when he said, whatever you've done for one of the least of these, my brothers, you've done it unto me, he skipped a word accidentally. This great rabbi missed a word. Apparently what he meant to say is the least important of these. But he didn't. He was talking about the most precious of these. He was talking about the poor. He was talking about the marginalized. He certainly was talking about the smallest and the youngest and the most vulnerable, those who are least able to speak for themselves, least able to protect themselves, least able to care for themselves, the least able to thank you and reward you as you deserve when you serve them. Jesus said in verse 4 and 40, then in that moment, mysteriously and wonderfully, what you did was you served me. You ministered unto me, not on my behalf, not, but literally to me. That, that was actually me. So that little boy uh, that you won't give up on, Jesus would say, uh, that's, that's me. That little girl that you protected, mm -hmm, that's me. The tears you brushed from that little orphan's cheeks, yeah, those were, those were my tears. That long overdue hug that you gave, I felt that. And that Matthew 25, 40 judgment day is in fact coming, my brothers and sisters. You can absolutely count on it. One trumpet blast from now, the dark glass will be removed, and the veil will be parted, and we will all understand the importance of children in the kingdom of God. We will all understand God's heart. A lot of surprises in that day. It's going to be surprising what was important and what wasn't important. It's going to be surprising who was important and who wasn't important. And in those days, we will understand that the little were big, and those of you who ministered to the little ones ministered directly to the heart of God. That day is absolutely coming. So we gather together like this, however, while we wait for that day, kingdom heroes gather to talk about the priority of orphan care, and we dare to dream of a world without orphans. I love Ruslan last night saying, we don't know how that's going to get done. We're just believing that it's going to get done. And I'm sure that that's what Moses said when he got to the Red Sea. And Joshua said when he got to the walls of Jericho, don't know how this is going to happen, but we're believing that God is going to step in and make this happen. So what would it actually take for this world to be a world without orphans? What would it look like? Is it even possible? What needs to change? Who needs to change? Today I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you my story. I have seen such a world where there are no orphans. I have been to that world where there are no orphans, and I want to describe it to you. Okay, it wasn't the whole world, but I was just a little boy, and it was the whole world to me. And it was a poverty-stricken little village in the Ivory Coast of West Africa. We did not so much as have a word for orphan in that village. There were absolutely no orphans in this poverty-stricken place. Let me explain. Those of you who have read Too Small to Ignore, you know a little of my story. But I'm going to tell you something on the orphan side that I've never told before. You know that I grew up the son of missionaries in the Ivory Coast of West Africa. 
You know that um, it was on the edge of the Sahara Desert, a hot, dusty place. 50 degrees centigrade was a typical day in my village. It was a hard place to survive, and many, many people didn't survive. We were visited by death in that village very, very often. I need to describe the setting to you because it is unusual that a setting as poverty-stricken as this would have no orphans. It was a hot, desolate place, as I said. We only had one road that came through our place. The hospital was more than a day away from where we lived. I was a typical little missionary kid, you know missionary kids. I ran around barefoot most of the time, just a pair of shorts on, uh, a slingshot around my neck at all times. I spoke four languages, but none of them very well. Um, I was the only white child for more than 100 miles in any direction in that little village. We had no electricity, no television, no radio. We had running water, but it was me with a bucket back and forth from the well to the house. <laughs> the village had a perspective that it takes the whole village to raise the children. This was not a plaque on the wall. This was their worldview. This was their practice. This is how they lived. And even the little white boy was loved like that. I never fell down without some African woman swooping in, picking me up, drying my tears, sending me on my way. In the evening campfires, I sat just as easily on a peasant African woman's lap as I did my own mother's lap. As you might imagine, I didn't get away with a lot of mischief because I stood out. My constant prayer every night was, Dear Lord, please, when I wake up in the morning, let my skin be black like all of my friends. And that would be the first thing I would check in the morning. They taught me what they taught their children. I learned how to hunt. I learned how to fish. By the time I was 15 years old, I was a fully qualified peasant farmer who could have made his living in that very, very harsh environment. But more important than the skills the poor of that village taught me the things that mattered to me. They taught me my character. They taught me my, my values. I learned about joy and love and hope from the poor. I learned about gratitude from the poor. I learned how to give and receive from the poor. I learned if courage is something that God blessed you with, that it's not for you. It's for you to be there for those who are frightened. I learned if God made you strong, it's not for you. It's for you to be there for those who who are weak. And most importantly in that village, I learned that children are the greatest treasure of all. I've often said everything I ever needed to know to lead Compassion's Worldwide Ministry, I learned from the poor around the campfires of that little village. And in my village, orphan care was a daily reality for everyone. Everything I know about orphan care, like everything I know about really anything that matters, I learned from the poor themselves. The first thing of all, and probably the most importantly, was that there was no word for orphan in our tribal language. Such a label for a child was inconceivable that a child could be in a condition long enough who, with their parents having died, to get a name like orphan was completely unacceptable. It was understood in our village that the care of every child was the community's responsibility. So when my father uh, was translating scriptures, he put the Sinifu language into writing and then translated scriptures. When he came to James 1.27, caring for orphans and widows in their affliction, well, we knew about widows. There were many, many widows, and we understood that that could be a life sentence. But the word orphan, they didn't understand that. In fact, we actually had to create a word for orphan. The concept of having lost parents and for that to be a long-term condition was something that was completely unacceptable. When they heard the new word and the concept, it saddened them. They thought, really, could that be the long-term status of a child? enough that we actually give it a label, orphan. Before these people of my village had even taken the Jesus road, which is how they described becoming a Christian, they had already understood instinctively and were living out the widow-orphan model of the early church. 
There was a lot of death. I saw a lot of death. I cried myself to sleep many, many nights. By the time I was 15 years old and left that village, half of my boyhood friends had died. And I watched what happens when, uh, when, when kids are left behind and their parents are gone. And I watched how the village embraced these children. And I assumed that that's how it was done everywhere in the world. And then I came to America, and I have now traveled the world, and I realized I was tragically, tragically wrong. So what did the poor do when they had many orphans and sudden orphans? Immediately, the grief-stricken child would be swept into the loving embrace of her nearest relatives and was taken into the family, into their homes. The extended family closed ranks because now she was their little girl. Orphanhood never lasted longer than the sunset of the first day where the parents had died because immediately the extended family closed ranks and swept in. And that family was not left alone. Suddenly the whole village surrounded that family. They stepped in to make sure that they were cared for. If the child had no extended family left, aunts and uncles, well, then she was taken in by the best, her best friend's family in the courtyard right next to it. The village grew and, and, and brought them into their embrace. Nobody was allowed to go hungry. Nobody was allowed to be sick. We worked in their fields on their behalf. At, orphan, at village gatherings, the orphans had first choice of the laps that they wanted to sit on, and everybody understood they needed the love more than the rest of us. Bargains were given away in the, in the marketplace to anyone who bought 10 mangoes. They got 15 mangoes with love and dignity and respect. Those who went out and gathered wood would have to stop in the courtyard of, these, uh, of, of the families taking care of an orphan to rest, supposedly. But some of the wood would fall and it would stay in the courtyard. We made sure that they had wood. We made sure that they had water. We shared our food from the cook fires. We gathered around with them. We ate uh, in, in their homes. We, we, we wept with them. We loved them. Listen, church, the village norm in where I grew up was that if you do not have an orphan child in your home, then you gave and cared for those who did. An orphan was everybody's concern, everybody's responsibility, everybody's joy. So let me just pause to say this, for there to be a world without orphans, every church and its surrounding community must wake up to the mandate. It cannot and will not be achieved without a major awakening of the church. Like my little African village, the church must realize and act on three things. Number one, children matter. I don't know why that's such a mystery, but I have fought for 38 years speaking up for those who can't speak for themselves. Secondly, every child belongs to every grown-up, no matter where they are. When any child suffers, we all suffer. When any child is blessed, we are all blessed. And thirdly, there is a role for every one of us in the battle. If you are a follower of Christ, this is your issue. So what does it look like? In my village, the children, as I said, were treasured by everyone, especially the orphan without a mother and father. The love began early with the children. The minute they were born, they were strapped to their mother's back and carried around on their mother's back. They were a part of everything. They heard the same voice from the outside that they had heard in the womb. They recognized their mother's laugh. They recognized their mother's prayers. They recognized their mother's singing because they had heard it from the other side of the wall in the tomb. They were included in everything. They were not hived off into a nursery somewhere. They were a part of every part of life. When they finally got to be two years old and were ready to learn how to walk, it was a joyous occasion. Uh, little anklets were put on the little child with little bells on it so that when they walked, the, there would be music. And I can remember so many times seeing a little two-year-old take their first step, and the whole village was ready, ready to cheer. You'd hear, jingle, and everyone would, yes! And the child would look, what? Jingle, jingle, yes! Every child 
In time, every little child across the village was walking from courtyard to courtyard, stomping their feet, making music, and we all cheered every step they took. Men took the children fishing, and they had us believe that the fish bite better when children are around, and even better when children sing. And so we sat under the mango trees, and we sang, thinking we were helping catch fish. In the marketplace, they included us in the business. We, 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 made, made, we made change. When we gave the extra mangoes, they let the children give the extra mango, and then they would whisper, it's because they bought this, because you were here. Every elder had a role in this village. You knew that when one of the little old ladies asked you to sing, uh, that you were going to get wild applause no matter how horribly you sang. Or dance, same thing. Always hugs, always tears, always stories. I remember one of the little ladies in our village, her name was Nyokun. And the great fun of Nyokun is she would take off her slipper and she would dance through the village with a line of 50 children behind her. And everybody would cheer when we came through. Listen, we make a big mistake when we overlook the role of the elderly when it comes to the orphan. Amen. Elderly people need to be needed, and children need the elderly people in their life. My book, Just a Minute, uh, the concept came from our village because we understood that the spirit of the children was like wet cement, and it didn't take much to make an impression that could last forever. And so they were always telling us important things. My, but you're brave. My, but you're strong. My, but God made you beautiful. I remember one man when I was six years old, one of the warriors said, you know what, Wes, you are really good with a slingshot. And you know, I shot a million rocks to prove him right across my childhood. Do you get the picture? Understand, well, if a poverty-stricken village can have no orphans, well, then surely we can have no orphan in our churches across the world. So we gather like this, and whose responsibility is the orphan? Why does all of heaven rush to the balconies to listen in when one little child is rescued? By the way, caring for orphans is different than caring about orphans. Caring about orphans can be done from a distance. It can be done safely, little action, little sacrifice. But caring for orphans requires courage and compassion and commitment and loving action and great sacrifice. As a follower of Christ, it is not a battle that you can stand on the sidelines. If you're a Christian, as I said, then this is a definition of your calling. If you can and will adopt a child, well, then you're one of the greatest heroes in the kingdom of God. If you can't or won't, then you still have a role to be there in the process. If you cannot adopt, then you must adapt. You must change how you think. You must join in the battles, speaking up for those who can't speak for themselves. You've got to adapt your worldview. You've got to adapt your priorities. You've got to adapt your resources. Adoption is expensive. And if you're not with an, uh, with an adopted child in your home, then you ought to be financing somewhere a family that is doing that. Every single church should have a dynamic, active orphan care program. No adoptive family should ever be within driving distance of the church without being supported and loved and cared for. So my prayer for us as we step into all of this is that God will bless this vision and that God will show us what it looks like and that we will be faithful. It's tricky to be faithful with a vision that you cannot fully uh, envision in your, in your mind. And my prayer for you, my precious heroes, is that in the middle of serving little children, in the middle of pouring yourselves into them child by child by child, that one day when you least expect it, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, a trumpet blast. And we will look up and we will see the sky roll back like a scroll and we will finally go home. Home where there are, there is no more death. Home, there is no more sickness, where there is no loneliness, indeed where there is not even any tears. Because Revelation tells us that God reserves the right to wipe the last tears from our eyes. Imagine that. God Almighty, the very hands that knit you and every orphan in their mama's womb, 
is waiting to wipe the last tears from their eyes and from your eyes. Imagine the hands that picked you up when you fell down and just didn't think you could go on. Those hands are waiting. The very hands that took the nails to redeem you are waiting to comfort you and the orphans and to wipe the tears from their eyes. And I don't know about you. I've lived 66 years now. I am ready to run into the, into the arms of my Savior. I have cried way too many tears in a lifetime of working with children in poverty. And I cannot wait for him to wipe the tears from my eyes. But oh, my prayer for me and for you is that as he wipes the tears from my eyes, your eyes, he also realizes he needs to wipe the sweat from your brow too. Because you fought for this vision of a world without orphans. You loved, you cared, you sacrificed until you were either achieving that mission or you were suddenly and wonderfully interrupted by heaven. May God bless you. I will see you there. And please bring millions of children with you. Let's talk about this for just a few moments. I know that the concept of a poverty-stricken village not having a word for orphan and understanding that it was everybody's duty. In your tables, I want you to, first of all, uh, talk about this. What characteristics, what attitudes, what actions did you hear me describe about that village that strikes you as something that the church should be able and ready to do? And then given what my village did, the second question, Describe what needs to be done at the, the local church as an institution. What needs to be in place? What attitude needs to be there? What actions need to be there in order for every church's community to be without orphans and all of the churches combined to be a world without orphans? What touched your heart about the poor in my village and how does that translate to a church doing what God has called it to do? Find your uh, shakers, be gentle with one another. Time is not your master, but your servant. And if God has something stirring in your heart, share with the others what you think it looks like and what you've heard and how we can make this, in fact, a world without orphans. God bless you.